Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. So we're going to talk today about how your thoughts create reality. It seems like I talk about that all the time, but if you go back through my episodes, I don't have any episodes on the fact that your thoughts create reality. I have definitely read some material from Neville Goddard and Joseph Murphy, hundreds of different authors, in fact, that confirm the idea that our thoughts create reality. But I want to stand with you here today and make the argument with you specifically that your thoughts create reality. Because I know I'm talking to someone out there that can hear my voice that simply doesn't believe this. Or they act like they believe it, but they simply don't when it comes down to it. They will take actions that simply go against the idea that their thoughts create reality. There are a lot of people who are offended by the idea that we create our reality. They see it as a version of blaming the victim. Nobody asks for bad things to happen to them. Of course not. But as someone who's been helping people change their thinking and behavior, I can also say that I couldn't agree more with the idea that we do indeed create much of our reality. Denying this denies your power. So it's very important that you accept this fact before you do anything else. Your thoughts create reality. If you Google the power of thoughts, you get a lot of results, including words like consciousness and swami and manifest and unleash. To me, these words suggest a basis not rooted securely in science and more rooted in marketing hype, but they are all based in truth. But let's see if we can find the science behind this. I want you to know that the influence your thoughts have on your physical and perceptual reality is well documented by scientific evidence. I think more articles should emphasize this point because it is the very real power we have to change our lives. If I was talking to my dad, who is really the scientific version of me, he would say, Brian, this is just magical thinking. I can assure you, it is not. Thoughts are real, tangible, measurable things, electrical impulses. They are powerful, and you can direct and use them to help you. Unfortunately, most of us let them hurt us unknowingly. My thoughts used to really hurt me, and I have chosen to change my thoughts, and it has changed my life. So the first concept I want you to understand that is really important is that your reality is the product of your unique brain. At the most basic level, your unique reality is constructed by your unique brain. Your brain is unlike anyone else's, and so is your reality. Making sense of the world and what happens is the result of your individual brain's interpretation of the signals it receives as you go about your days interacting with your environment. Much of what you think of as reality is really a construction of your brain. This is really important for you to understand, and I continually try to remind myself of this. You do not actually experience the world directly. In the neuroscience of reality, Debbie Hampton writes, it may feel as though you have direct access to the concrete physical world through your senses, but you don't. Your senses do not experience the world directly. When you touch something, it feels like the touch is happening in your fingers. However, it is not. It's happening in your brain. The same is true for all your senses. Seeing doesn't happen in the eyes. Hearing doesn't take place in your ears. Smelling does not happen in your nose. These are all activities of your brain. In his book, The Brain, The Story of You, David Eagleman writes, here's the key. The brain has no access to the world outside. Sealed within the dark, silent chamber of your skull, your brain has never directly experienced the external world and it never will. Instead, there's 
only one way that information from out there gets into the brain. Everything you experience, every sight, sound, smell, rather than being a direct experience, is an electrochemical rendition in a dark theater. This is an important distinction. It means that your brain assigns meaning to the electrical signals it receives. Its interpretation is determined by your subconscious. Each of us experiences the world subjectively as our brains interpret stimuli determined by our physical brain function, memories, beliefs, and attitudes about ourselves, others, and the world shaped by family, religion, school, culture, and life experiences past and present. These influences are typically below conscious awareness and determine how a person responds to the world, interacts in relationships, and thinks of and talks to themselves. So stimuli coming into your brain are neutral. Nothing is good or bad or associated with any emotions or actions until your brain attaches those things to it. Therein lies the power to influence your reality. You can consciously direct and influence your thoughts at that point. As Stephen Covey said, each of us tends to think we see things as they are, that we are objective, but that's not the case. We see the entire world as we are or as we are conditioned to see it. And there is science to prove this. In Jonah Lehrer's book, Proust was a neuroscientist. He tells of experiments conducted by Frederick Brochet in 2001 at the University of Bordeaux. Appropriately enough, the experiments involved wine. In the first one, Brochet took two glasses of the exact white wine, colored one of them red with food coloring and proceeded to get observations from 57 wine experts. The experts described the red wine in terms of its jamminess and other red wine jargon. Not one of them identified it as a white wine. In another test, Brochet took the same medium quality Bordeaux and served it in two different bottles. One bottle was labeled to look like a fancy fine wine while the other was labeled to resemble a common table wine. The wine experts gave this exact same wine in different bottles, very different ratings. The wine in the expensive bottle was described as agreeable, complex, balanced, rounded, while the identical wine with a cheap looking label was said to be weak, short, light, flat, and faulty. What these wine experiments illuminate is the omnipresence of subjectivity, our human brain has been designed to believe itself, wired so that prejudices feel like facts, opinions are indistinguishable from the actual sensations. If we think the wine is cheap, it will taste cheap. If we think we are tasting a grand crew, then we will taste a grand crew. Your brain is a subjective lens through which you view your life. Blair explains that the taste of wine, like everything in life, is more than the sum of our senses. What we experience is not what we literally sense. Our experiences are the interpretations of sensations by a subjective brain, which factors in our unique beliefs, biases, memories, and desires every time. In a very literal sense, your brain is a subjective lens through which you experience life. Lara goes on to say that even if we could experience the wine exactly as it is, without subjectivity, we would still all taste it differently because each of our brains is unique on a cellular level. And the part of the brain which interprets taste and smell is extremely malleable. It is forever growing and pruning neurons throughout our lives. The research of Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck further illustrates the influence of our minds on our reality. Her research is the basis of an understanding of how your brain and mindset affect your reality. In her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, she explores the power of our beliefs, both conscious and unconscious, and how even the simplest changes can have a measurable impact on almost every aspect of life. She writes, for 20 years my research has shown that the view you adapt for yourself profoundly affects the way you lead your life. It can determine whether you become the person you want to be and whether you accomplish the things you value. Harvard psychologist Ellen Langer 
study the effect of thoughts on hotel mates. Even though these women spent all day moving their bodies, pushing vacuum cleaners, going up and down steps, bending and stretching, 67% of them said they got no exercise. Langer told half the maids that their activity level met the U.S. Surgeon General's definition of an active lifestyle. The other group did not receive similar information. Both groups just did their jobs as usual for a month. Langer's team measured the maids' physical health statistics. At the beginning of the study, the findings matched the maids' perceived lack of exercise. When measured a month later, the group that was told their job actively qualified as exercise saw a decrease in weight and waist to hip ratio and a 10% drop in blood pressure. None of the maids had changed their routines. The only differences were in how one group viewed what they did. According to Langer, if you believe that you are exercising, then your body responds as if you are. One study showed that being told you slept well or poorly determined how people's bodies physically responded. In the study, researchers explained the effects of REM sleep on sleep quality and told participants that average REM sleep should be around 20 to 25 percent of total sleep. Participants were then divided into groups assigned a sleep quality fitted with sensors and told that the researchers were monitoring vital signs in REM sleep. The monitoring was false, as were the group labels. The below average group was led to believe they got 16.2 percent REM sleep, while the above average group was told they got 28 percent REM sleep. After the results were dispensed, the researchers administered cognitive tests to the study participants, assessing basic math and verbal skills. People who were told they had low quality sleep performed worse on the tests and showed more cognitive deficits than the control and high quality sleep groups. Everything in your life is similar to the wine, the maid, and the sleep experiments. Everything. Every situation or event, past, present, or future, becomes what your brain defines it to be. In a recent interview I had with Nick Zay, he refers to the universe as a placebo universe. So when you look at everything that you're defining your life as, it is all happening within. There is no true reality. It is only subjective. In this way, in this understanding, your experience of reality is your own creation. Your brain even physically responds by reinforcing neural connections that coincide with your predominant habitual thinking, a concept known as neuroplasticity. In other words, your recurrent thinking patterns physically shape your brain's form and function, which then reinforces and encourages more of the same kind of thinking. It might feel in some situations like you can't choose your thoughts, that everything is subconscious, but at a minimum, you can choose how you respond to your thoughts. There is your control. This is your power you have to change your brain and life for the better. Controlling your thoughts, changing your thoughts, is directed neuroplasticity. It gives you the power to choose. Change your thoughts and change your world, as Norman Vincent Peale says. Neuroplasticity is actually an umbrella term referring to the many capabilities of your brain to reorganize itself throughout your life due to your environment, behavior, and internal experiences. Science used to believe that the brain was only changeable during certain periods in childhood. While it is true that your brain is much more plastic in the early years and capacity declines with age, plasticity happens throughout your life from birth to death. Science has confirmed that you can access neuroplasticity for positive change in your own life in many ways. Harnessing neuroplasticity in adulthood isn't quite as simple as some people promise, but it can most definitely be accomplished under specific circumstances. From childhood through adulthood, the events of your life shape your brain. As little people grow, interact with others, and explore the world, connections are wired in their brains based on their experiences. When you're young, most of what happens is out of your control, or it feels like that. As adults, our brains are reflections of our daily routines. Your habits, both good and bad, literally get wired into your brain. As an adult, neuroplasticity does not happen as readily as it does in a child's brain, at least according to science, but it does happen. There are ways you can intentionally encourage and guide 
neuroplasticity to change in adulthood. You can try something new, mix things up, turn off your GPS, change your habits, exercise in a different way, train your brain, take trips and be social, do things that you don't normally do and you change the way your brain is normally working. Your mind sculpts your brain. Everything you think, hope, feel and imagine physically changes your brain for better or worse. You can intentionally harness this process for your benefit. Daniel Allman writes in You Are Not Your Brain, The Four-Step Solution for Changing Bad Habits. We can actually use the mind to change the brain. The simple truth is that how we focus our attention, how we intentionally direct the flow of energy and information through our neural circuits can directly alter the brain's activity and its structures. There's ways we can do this through mindfulness, Research about the positive impact of mindfulness on the brain and mental health points to neuroplasticity as the cause in mindfulness by intentionally directing attention inward and cultivating awareness of the breath or thought and feelings. You are becoming aware of your brain's default mode network and exerting control over it. When you guide your default mode network, you're interrupting habitual thought patterns and orienting your brain in the present moment. Secondly, meditation, along with many scientifically proven benefits of meditation for your brain, it increases neuroplasticity. Meditation has been proven to decrease stress, anxiety, and depression, which has been shown to limit neurogenesis and the birth of new brain cells. And you don't need to meditate for years to start reaping benefits. One study showed brain changes after just eight weeks of regular meditation. Third, Visualization. Neurons fire and chemicals are released in your brain whether something is real or imagined. Because as I said before, you're not experiencing the actual world. Sometimes the brain doesn't know the difference. So on brain scans, imaginative thoughts activate many identical brain areas which directly influence you physically and emotionally. From a neuroscientific perspective, imagining an act and doing it are not that different. Visualization allows you to put your imagination to work for you to change your brain. Research has validated the practice influences physical changes from muscle strength to brain pathways. Now I've spent the last 15 minutes giving you the scientific rationale. This is directed to people I've met recently that have tried to tell me that there is no scientific basis on the fact that thoughts create reality. The truth is your thoughts are all powerful. But let's move beyond that. And have you really ever stopped to consider the profound power of our thoughts and what they hold over our lives? The age old adage, you become what you think is not just a poetic statement, but a truth that holds deep resonance in the fabric of our existence. So let's explore the transformative power of our thoughts and how they sculpt the very reality we experience. At the core of our being, our thoughts are the genesis of everything. They are the silent architects that build our beliefs, influence our actions, and ultimately shape our destinies. Each thought, no matter how fleeting, sends ripples into the vast ocean of our consciousness, influencing our perspective and in turn, our reality. Consider for a moment the power of belief. A child who believes they can achieve great heights will take actions aligned with that belief. In contrast, a child who believes they are limited will often not venture beyond their perceived boundaries. Both realities are crafted by the foundational thoughts and beliefs they hold. The world did not tell them what to be. Their beliefs derived from their thoughts painted their world. Scientifically, the power of our thoughts has been demonstrated through the placebo effect. Patients, when given sugar pills, but told they were receiving medication, have shown significant improvements solely based on on their belief their thoughts about healing and recovery without any actual medicinal intervention influenced their physical reality but the influence of our thoughts goes beyond the individual thoughts especially when amplified collectively shape cultures societies and the course of history when a group believes in a cause be it justice innovation or revolution their collective consciousness becomes a force of nature, moving mountains and redefining reality. When we start to really think about thoughts, we start to think about imagination. 
something that we've talked a lot about, particularly with Neville Goddard, who really loved to use the term imagination creates reality, referring to the imagination as God. The realm of the imagination is often considered the playground of the artist, the inventor, or the child. It's seen as a divergence from the real world, a place of dreams, fantasies, and fleeting whimsy. But what if I told you the power of the imagination is the very crucible in which our reality is forged? At its essence, imagination is the ability to form images, ideas, and sensations in our mind without any immediate input from the senses. It is the canvas of creativity where everything and anything is possible. Every great invention, piece of art, or social movement at its inception was just a fragment of someone's imagination. Take the Wright brothers, for instance. Before their aerodynamic feats became a reality, the idea of human flight was merely a figment of imagination relegated to myths and dreams but it was their ability to vividly imagine and then act upon the imagination that transformed a world bound by gravity into one where we could soar among the clouds. However, the alchemy of turning imagination into reality isn't exclusive to monumental achievements. It's an integral part of our daily lives. When you visualize your goals, imagine a desired outcome or mentally rehearse a skill, you're laying the cognitive blueprints for that scenario to manifest in reality. And I've now pointed to this neuroscientific research that basically says that our brains can't distinguish between what we're vividly imagining and what we're actually experiencing. What I am fascinated by is that you can find echoes of this bouncing around everywhere from Tony Robbins to New Thought Churches to t-shirts at Target. The Secret which has sold millions of copies claims to teach you how to unlock the hidden potential of the universe to bring all you desire with the law of attraction. Regardless of the modality or philosophy, the simple explanation is this. Focus on the desired outcome in your mind and it will happen. This isn't a new idea and not by a long shot. Back in the 1800s, Emerson said, speak your latent conviction and it shall be a universal sense for the inmost in due time becomes the outmost. I create reality by taking an idea in my mind and bringing it into existence. Going back hundreds of years, people have held the belief that human mind is capable of changing reality. It's obvious. I have an idea in my mind for a chair. I think about the, what the chair will look like, what to make it out of, and what color it will be, all in my mind. Then I create the chair by purchasing the materials and going to work on the wood. And the chair is created. What about things we don't seem to have direct control over? We've talked about the science of this, and most of those things are with the body or things we have direct control over. Can this same creative process explain how we create all parts of our reality? Let's start with how our thoughts can change our minds and make us seek out certain types of information. If I spend a day thinking a negative thought such as, I am lazy, how would that impact me? How would that impact you? I would consider myself lazy and also discover other thoughts such as, no wonder no one likes me or I can't be successful because I'm too lazy or I can't get anything done because I'm too lazy or it's just gonna be too hard because I'm too lazy. The seed thought of I am lazy when nurtured with constant repetition and focus grows into similar thoughts. Like attracts like. One thought attracts other thoughts that are similar. Most have experienced this with the downward spiral of procrastinating or gaining weight. Take it a step further. And it's not hard to see the connection between our thoughts and our actions. Far from pseudoscience, the relationship between positive thinking and positive actions is well documented. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a commonly used technique used for treating anxiety, depression, borderline personality disorder. It's based on the principle that our thoughts, emotions, and actions all influence each other. If I'm afraid of getting in a car crash, I might start thinking about a car turning in front of me. The collision the trip to the hospital and someone dying. The sequence will cause physiological changes related to my emotions, an increased heart rate, 
a stomach ache, or nausea, then it will influence my actions by causing me to decide not to get into a car or to not only drive certain roads at a certain time of day. If I repeat this cycle while I'm behind the wheel, I may be so paranoid about an accident that I actually drive worse, thereby increasing my chances of getting into an accident. We've all seen this. This could be a form of manifestation as self-fulfilling prophecy or creating my own reality. On the positive note, thoughts like I am creative might lead similar thoughts to I could write a book. I should start painting again. These thoughts might result in an uplifted mood, which increases dopamine in the brain and energizes the body. I might then decide to purchase some painting supplies or sign up for a new course on writing books. There's nothing mystical going on here yet, but it is still an example of change your thinking, change your life. Let's take it a step further and talk about how the thought patterns we've been discussing can shape the way we see the world. This boils down to the fundamental understanding of how human perception works. As I mentioned before, our brains fill in the gaps of our perception so seamlessly that we don't recognize it's happening. We've all seen the different optical illusions like the spinning dancer or the train that's moving and you think it's moving forward but it's actually moving backwards or it's moving right or left. It's all perception. The brain fills in gaps of our perception so seamlessly that we don't even recognize it's happening. You observe this phenomenon like a blind spot in your eye and being able to read a sentence even when all the words are slightly misspelled. What we control and what we really start to create our reality is in how we perceive, interpret, think about the events in our life that generate our feelings about those events and how we subsequently respond with our behavior. No one can choose your thoughts or actions. Those are yours alone. It seems there is conscious and unconscious influence over how we perceive things. We also create our reality through language. Check out my episode on the power of language and the ways that one language can define a reality for you as opposed to another. For instance, the French refer to a bridge in masculine terms and the Germans refer to it in feminine terms completely colors and changes the way that you think about that single word so far we've been talking about our perceived reality that's what we believe and assume about the things we see what about actually creating something from nothing or manifesting reality through our thoughts I remember a woman I knew who wanted a Tesla for zero dollars down and zero dollars per month. Sounds crazy, right? She repeatedly said, I own a Tesla and I owe nothing down on it and nothing per month. She puts it up on a vision board and after three months of looking at this, she enters a relationship with a man who is a firefighter who has a Tesla. She has her Tesla to drive for zero dollars down and zero dollars a month. Now this is just one example of millions of people who will testify that this is possible. Millions of people testify that manifestation is possible. Every single time I read one of these episodes from an author, they're giving multiple examples. How many examples do you need? Millions? Billions, because that's what it feels like we've been given from these different examples. How can merely thinking about something bring it into existence? Throughout human existence, we observe the world around us and create rules and laws to explain it. The scientific method was created as a way to objectively observe, manipulate, measure, and come to conclusions about the natural universe. This arose with the 19th century scientific revolution that brought mechanistic science to the mainstream. Still today, this mechanistic or Newtonian science is the foundation of what is being taught in schools and how most Westerners see the world. It's because of this that they deny the idea that thoughts create reality because that's looked as anti-science. Mechanistic science treats the entire world as a machine 
similar to how I press the power button on my computer and it turns on. The natural world responds to events in a predictable fashion. There are a few laws that were created to explain how the natural world works, which you may have heard of. One is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Another is energy is never created or destroyed, only moved or transformed. Remember that humans create these laws to make sense of what they observe. Our scientific laws and truths are only current best definitions of what actually is, and they have changed many times over the course of history. There are a few problems with these Newtonian laws, most notably the law of gravity. You've heard the whole apple fell on Newton's head story, right? First of all, it's not a true story. More importantly, while Newton was the first to call it gravity and come up with a mathematical formula for it, he was wrong. Newton believed gravity was action at a distance or that objects exert some invisible force that attracts other objects. Well, there are a few interesting scenarios where Newton's law didn't quite hold up. And we now know, given new evidence and new tests, that Newton was wrong. So how does gravity actually work? Einstein is the currently accepted winner of this debate with the theory of general relativity. Rather than action at a distance, Einstein's theory is that objects actually curve the fabric of space-time, causing them to move like a marble spinning around a drain always headed towards the eventual end point. So it's clear that our understanding of the universe, that there are things known and there are things unknown and in between, as Aldous Huxley said, are the doors of perception. So what does all this science mumbo-jumbo have to do with creating your own reality? It serves as an important point to show us that we don't have all the answers and that the current way of defining cause and effect is based on an old mechanistic viewpoint that's been disproven. We've seen that humanity's ability to collect data, make decisions, and impart our will on the world is incredible and not replicated in any other species. We use this unique power to grow our own food, make water drinkable, create new molecules, and see backwards in time. So do we also use this power to create our own reality? As in, can we manifest the reality we want? Let's assume the law of cause and effect is true. Every effect has a cause that precedes it. In other words, life isn't random chaos. We reap what we sow. To determine the rules for this law, i.e. how it works, we would have to conduct an experiment. In the experiment, we would repeat the same action over and over again and see if it produces the same results. I got a new job. That's the effect. What was the cause of me getting in the new job? Well, you might assume it was because I applied for a job. To test this theory, we have a thousand other people apply for a job, the cause, to see if they get a new job. But to prove this cause and effect, the experiment would have to work 100% of the time. If even one of those thousand people didn't get the job, I would be certain that applying was not the cause of me getting a new job. So what was the cause? Most likely, it's a combination of upbringing, education, beliefs, talents, interests, previous employment history, and the fact that I applied. How can I prove this? I can't. There's no way to perfectly reproduce my entire life to see if things still work out the same. In short, we can't know what the cause is to a lot of the effects we see in our lives. Neville Goddard said there was one cause, and that was the Creator. We can get into that on another level. It's not the point of this episode. I want you who are doubters that are of the scientific background to look at this and understand that it's still very possible. There's a huge limitation in the scientific method. It's simply unable to account for all the data in human life. People have been pointing out for years that the mechanistic viewpoint of how the world works ignores or denies human agency, values, creativity, and personal or individual evolution. When science is unable to prove something, what are you left with? Direct experience, intuition, and faith. Our Newtonian upbringing causes us to assume the outcomes of our lives are exclusively due to physical earthly processes, but what if they're not? What if like millions of people have believed over the centuries there's not just physical law and also spiritual law? What if the earthly is but the showing forth of some of the results of that law? 
This idea isn't at odds with science, physics, or mathematics. We can accept those principles as true while still having faith in the unseen workings of the universe. All we're doing is adding an unknown variable to our equations. The cause of getting a job could be a daily visualization and affirmation practice. The mind and spoken word could influence the ethers to bring about the job I desire and place me directly in its path. I have no way to know for certain based on the limitations of current scientific models and maybe I'm not meant to know. Maybe faith is a part of the equation. But quantum physics does establish that there is a role of consciousness with the observer effect. One of the most famous and puzzling aspects of quantum physics is the observer effect demonstrated in experiments like the double slit experiment. In its basic form, the experiment shows that particles can act both as particles and waves. What's particularly strange is the behavior of these particles changes based on whether they're being observed. Some interpretations suggest that the act of observation collapses the wave function into a definite state. Beyond that, there's so many amazing authors that have documented the ways in which thoughts create reality. Of course you have Neville Goddard, who proposed that imagination creates reality. Then secondly, you have Napoleon Hill. His foundational principle is that thoughts are things. He believed that a clear and strong desire paired with persistent thought and positive emotion could manifest real world outcomes. He emphasized the importance of the subconscious mind, faith, and visualization in achieving one's desires. Then you have Joseph Murphy, who proposed that our subconscious processes are the creators of reality. Then there's James Allen. Allen's work suggests that a person's mind shapes their reality comparing thoughts to a garden, he writes, as he thinks in his heart, so he is, suggesting that individuals have the power to dictate their circumstances based on their innermost thoughts. Then you have Dr. Wayne Dyer, who taught and believed the transformative power of thoughts. He said that change the way you look at things and the things you look at change, emphasizing the role of perception in shaping reality. There's Lewis Hay, Rhonda Byrne, Dr. Joe Dispenza, Deepak Chopra, Neil Donald Walsh. All of them propose this. There's hundreds more. So, if you don't believe that your thoughts create reality at this point, I'm not sure what else I can do. The process of actually creating the reality that you want is an art form. And in many ways, it's that old story of the blind men that come upon the elephant. I've said it many times, and so many speakers love to use that analogy. But we are all the blind men that come upon this elephant. Some feel the trunk, some feel the tail, some feel the leg, and our perception of that element is colored by a very limited understanding of this world. So we don't entirely know, and we may not ever entirely know the process of it. We've talked about all this, but let me give you my story. I would watch YouTube, read books, and become aware of this phenomenon, tested it out very often, something very simple. I would like to get a red apple. And I would say to myself, I want this red apple. And then I would start researching it and say, oh, I need to do a little bit more than just think about the red apple. I'm gonna taste it. Hold the red apple in my hands. Taste it and imagine that it's my red apple. And then I wanna have this red apple for no money. I want a free red apple. How am I gonna have this free red apple? So. I imagined that I was holding an apple that was free and I could feel the joy of holding this free red apple. And literally a couple of days later, a neighbor comes by and says, we got some extra red apples. I just wanted to give you some. This is not a coincidence. This kind of thing happens all the time. On a larger scale, I used to watch YouTube videos and read books all the time. And I would imagine that I have written my own book and done my own YouTube videos that people are watching. So I would see my book with my name on it. I would see my book and imagine it. I would imagine the feeling of other people talking about my book, holding the book in my hands. Next thing you know, I've written a book. I would imagine 
watching my own YouTube videos, listening to the sound of my voice, the feeling of satisfaction and fulfillment for having done the video. And then months later, I have that exact moment where I'm watching myself, hearing my voice and feeling that feeling of satisfaction. That is just one of a million stories I can give because literally every single second of your life has been created by a thought from the past. Everything. And so every moment of your life is an example of the ways that your thoughts create reality because you are living within a thought construct. So I would love for you to share in the comments how your thoughts have created reality. This is important. I want to hear your story. Maybe I can mention it in a future episode and go through some of the comments, but other people need to see this. I still meet people all the time that simply do not believe their thoughts have any creation of reality. And that is creative. When you say to yourself, my thoughts don't create reality, then you actually take away some of the really creative power of your thoughts. So please put in the comments, anything, any story that you have, maybe something happened today, of your thoughts creating reality. And I'm speaking to that person in the back of the room that doubts what I'm saying. And I'm saying, look, if you don't want to believe, that's fine. But if you choose to believe this, then you have the power to change your world. You have the power to do whatever you want. And this is an amazing power. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution.